This lesson this time is a little bit different. Um, I've been going back and forth about what I wanted to do, and I had a list of questions and, and just different things that I had basically decided on uh, discussing for this lesson. And I was on my way to Japan. I, a couple of weeks ago, I actually went to Japan to do a couple of weeks of, um, of uh, rehearsing and, and playing with a Japanese pianist over there. And while I was on the flight over, I was uh, sort of going through my list of questions and compiling things and looking at emails that people had sent me. And quite often people ask you about different musicians you've played with. Um, for drummers, I mean, you get a lot of questions about bass players and, you know, who's your favorite this or that or, um, you know, what's it like to play with so-and-so. And I've been really lucky in that I've been able to play with so many of my... Um, sort of my heroes growing up, people I saw when I was a kid that uh, really influenced me, bass players, um, Willie, John Patitucci, and a number of people, just you know, to name a few. Um, one of the main guys that's really influenced me as well as you know, just a number of drummers over the years is, is Anthony Jackson. Um, and his body of work is, is just astounding in terms of the, rec the recordings he's played on and the, you know, just the people he's played with and um, his knowledge of, of his instrument and of drummers has always been really, really heavy. Whenever I've been on gigs and, and I've been with Anthony, I, I quiz him about all kinds of stuff and I've learned a lot from him just listening to him play and listening to his concepts or ideas about things and, and you know, what he looks for and what he likes. Um, so I thought it would be a good idea this time because I was going to be on this gig with him for a couple of weeks if I could manage to get him on tape commenting about, you know, anything from his favorite drummers or what he likes, what he looks for in drummers, and just his opinions about a number of things. I thought it would be really invaluable if drummers could, could hear it straight from, from his mouth. Um... And I was particularly curious about uh, what it was like to play with Tony Williams or Buddy Rich or, you know, Gad, any of these types of people that all of which he had, had done. So without any further ado, I'm just going to let this roll. This is uh, basically part one of what ended up being a, a pretty long interview. I asked Anthony a bunch of questions, basically while, while I was sitting there chowing down my dinner. <laughs> um and I did it on my mini disc recorder backstage at this gig. It's it's a little noisy occasionally because it's kind of an old mini disc recorder. But um, you'll occasionally hear some people come in and out of the room. But uh, you can still hear everything he has to say relatively clearly. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. And here it is. Thanks. So I thought it would uh, be beneficial now that we're playing together on this gig for a week and. I'm, I'm curious to know your opinions about some things um, in terms of, like, I guess for starters, what what's the first thing you look for when you play with someone, like when you play with a drummer for the first time, or when you play, like, what's the signal, what's, what's the first, your preference, the first thing that you would enjoy about playing with someone, if you had to pick? I suppose after so many years, um one develops a very broad and rich picture of what one would like to hear. Um, I suppose a good analogy would be someone who's really into wines would look for a number of characteristics to judge the wine, some of them very subtle and some of them that would be unknown to anyone who doesn't drink wine. Nose, uh, start, finish, I don't even know all of the terms, but I hear them described. Clearly, for a drummer now, at this point in my life, you look for the package. You look for all the things that you've learned over many, many years playing with great drummers. You look for a uh, solid command of time. A solid command, an instinctive command of concept. When you begin playing with someone, you expect them to settle in very quickly with what they're going to do. Settle in how? Like Stylistically. What? you expect someone to sort of right away hit something very, very nice. 
without hunting through half a dozen different styles to find things. The great drummers do that automatically. Even if they change what they're doing later on, or according to the wishes of the artist or producer, you feel right away that they have a command of styles, a rich command of styles and things within styles, so they instantly make you feel aware and comfortable with what they're doing. And along with that comes an instant awareness that they're listening to what you are doing. As a bass player, you instantly feel when a drummer is doing whatever he's going to do while also paying attention to what you're doing as a player. And certainly, the farther up the chain you go, the more mature and experienced and gifted the drummer is, the quicker you settle into that kind of a relationship. Typically, with a first-class drummer and a good bass player, that kind of relationship is established in the first minute or two. You know instantly what kind of communication you're going to have. You know instantly how much listening is being done. Of course, there are other vain characteristics, like you can tell if someone is enjoying playing with you. You know if you enjoy playing with them. And again, if you live long enough, you get to find, you get to be in positions where you instantly form a tight relationship with the drummer it, within minutes. You know, it sounds like there's a, a pretty, I've always had the impression of you being sensitive to, to the confidence and and when when someone whenever you play with a drummer, you seem to be much more sensitive to the confidence level if the guy's hitting, if the guy is really digging in and showing you right off the bat. That it's well, that's what I meant when I said right away, someone as soon as they begin playing, display a knowledge about what they're going to play without hunting and pausing and being timid. Well, um, the knowledge. I mean, uh, uh, what I'm more referring to is the attack of the instrument or the intent. You know, that really goes without saying. I thought about mentioning that by way of other instrumentalists. I remember thinking of certain people who the instant they sat down conveyed a very reassuring sense of confidence. Richard T. was one, great pianist. The instant he sat down and lifted the lid of the piano, you felt that this was someone married to the instrument who knew it so well that there was no ritual involved. He just sat down and played. Steve Gadd is another. Nothing fancy, just sits down, picks up the sticks, and you're aware, even before he plays, that this is someone who has no issues with his instrument. There's no ritual of getting set. There's no looking around to see who's listening. It's just a matter of slamming into the instrument. That's something that you take for granted when you've, uh, I guess you've been around the block a few times. All of the great players have that to some real extent. And when you say slamming, you're not, you're as, as much referring to intellectually slamming as you are to, you know, to actually physically hitting the instrument. I'm looking at attributes of virtuosity, and there are many, uh, time, tone, touch, developmental concepts, but there's also a certain feeling that puts you at ease knowing that, well, that part of the music is taken care of. You just feel. No need to worry here. No need to look over and wonder if the person next to you has got it, struggling with it, unsure of it, wondering if they'll ever get it. Certainly, again, I'm looking down now. Someone who has fewer years left to play than have already passed certainly you feel like you've earned the right to make decisions like this and to say that you can tell when somebody is set to give everything they can with a knowledge that it's going to sound great. You can feel it. It does add to the strength of the bond between drums and bass. It makes it probably, I think, the most important relationship within any band. Drums and bass are really where um, the deck of the battleship supports all the guns that sit on top of it. You've really got to have that straight. And um, again, trying to use the analogy of fine wines, 
if you've been tasting or drinking or collecting wines long enough, you just know. You know as soon as you take a sip, whether it's a great wine, whether you found it in the gutter, or whether you paid $20,000 for it. You can put all that aside, just sample it, and you know. You're a goddamn expert. Yeah. So that's basically where that comes, I think. Is there, um, when, when you play with people, you know, who shall remain, and anyone who will remain nameless at this point, but when you play with a drummer, is there like a common mistake that you see that is something that, that, that you don't like, that you see often? I would say they are faults that you would hear typical to all performing artists. Everybody has weak points. Certainly for a drummer, you never want to feel the groove slip. You never want to feel the time breathe. Uh, there are occasions when the time does breathe and it enhances the music. But as a rule, you don't want things slipping and sliding from a drummer. That comes down to confidence and experience and the level of virtuosity. Sorry, I got a little noisy there, so I paused it. My next question for you is, what was it like to play with Buddy Rich? <clears throat> As I eat my Well, I played with him in two periods. The first in uh, mid or late, late 73. I showed up with no rehearsal, just called out of the blue, mm -hmm. because uh, I had a very, very close friend, still have a close friend, whose family was very close to Buddy, so he knew who I was and had heard some discussions about what I was doing and suggested when his bass player was leaving that I be called. So I showed up, no rehearsal. 120 charts. 120 and charts? At the time, there were 120 charts. No rehearsal, I just had to play cold. I didn't do all that well because my reading wasn't up to spec. Mm -hmm. So I took a year and beat my head against the wall, sprayed blood all over the room. <laughs> and within a year, I'd gotten it together. Auditioned a second time, and I got the gig. How old were you the first time? 20. Second time, 21. Mm -hmm. And by the time you got the gig the second time, had you already done other stuff? Or yeah. was it the first? I did not much. I'd done some, uh, a few records. Mm -hmm. Things were just really getting off the ground for me. Mm -hmm. But I always was good at playing the blues. You had to be a teenager at that time. People got together and nobody knew what songs other people knew. And the only thing you had in common was blues. Mm -hmm. So let's play a blues in D. How about a slow blues in F? How about a shuffle blues in G? How about a high speed swing blues in D? And so that being the core of everything, um, anyone who came up in that period and did a lot of playing uh, had the basis of what was required to work with a drummer like Buddy. Uh, only, of course, you had to be a really good sight reader and had to be something that I was very fortunate in. I fell right in with him. We immediately hit it off musically. He was very comfortable. And I found once I got past the awesome experience of sitting four feet from Buddy Rich, and it took, it took a couple of weeks playing six nights a week, two sets a night. You know, there were times when I had to stop, almost stop playing and just stare at what he was doing. But then it began to feel very natural. And certainly, it sounds patronizing to say that's how you know a drummer like Buddy was as great as he was. But really, even at the nuclear best, when he was just playing at a transcendental level, it was possible to fall right in. It, it felt so right that you just did it. And he dug it. There was no, God damn it, kid, what do you think you're doing? It just worked. Hmm. It was a magic relationship. And then I went on to do two sets a night, six nights a week for 13 months with Buddy Rich. Jeez. And 
Where was this? In at New his York? club. At his club. At his club on 64th and 2nd Avenue, Buddy's Place hmm. in New York. What year was this? 74, 75. Hmm. And he really put the polish on for me. Hmm. There's, there's no experience that would have been comparable to being a bass player sitting four feet from Buddy Rich that much, that often. You know, I, I, while we got this going, you've told me this story before about the time that he was practicing the uh, karate chops backstage. He broke his thumb. You gotta, you gotta tell that because that's a brilliant. Story. But he was a black belt, and he had a practice pad on the wall of his dressing room upstairs at the club, and he'd punch it before the gig. I don't know how often he worked on it. I never actually saw him working on it. I did see it in the dressing room. One day I got to the club and his manager, Stanley Kay, said, um, Buddy's uh, just coming back from the hospital and broke his thumb working out on his pad. And I said, well, is he going to play? He says, I, he's intending to play. He's going to be in a cast, but he's going to play. And I thought, well, I guess it's going to be a somewhat subdued night tonight. He shows up at the club and his left arm from the thumb up halfway to the elbow is in a hard plaster cast. He was in a really foul mood. <laughs> All right, let's get up and play. God damn it. One of those moods. And damn it if Buddy Rich didn't sit down, take a stick, and force it into the cast. He pushed it into the cast where it was firmly anchored, like sticking out at an angle. He played two sets. It was unbelievable. It was one of the most unbelievable things I've ever seen. He was clearly in tremendous pain. His face was red with pain. But I could also see he was he was proving something to himself. Yeah. He was really gonna I'm sure that nothing was gonna defeat him. And he played <coughs> two sets and kicked ass up and down the drum set. Phenomenal. After the first set, he pulled the stick out and went upstairs. I don't know what he did with it, with, it, uh, with the uh, with the injury then. But he came back out and did a second set. And it's important to remember, I'm not exaggerating. It was a hard cast, and he wasn't able to do anything with his fingers. He couldn't move the stick; it was stuck into the cast. And you could hear some limitation on what he could do with rudiments in the left hand. But it in no way invalidated the night. It was just amazing. It was fantastic. What about, uh, I was also going to ask you about the first time you played with Steve Gatt. Do you remember? A session at one of the long gone CBS studios in New York. I can't remember which one it was, but uh, Steve was setting up, I don't remember who the session was for, and it was this short guy, short, he's like my height, a short guy with bushy hair, big smile, and he seemed like a really nice guy, and I remember asking him, hey Steve, how old are you? He said, 29. Considering now he's, I think, 61. <laughs> Gives you an idea of how long ago that was. And right away, of course, you knew what was going on. You, I, I could tell from the first few bars of whatever it was we were playing. Um, this is exactly who people said he was. He was a tremendous drummer. And again, I felt completely at home right away. No sense of awe. And I suppose that might puzzle people. I've never been in awe just playing with a drummer, a great drummer. Whoever it was, the instant you started playing, you felt right at home. And I realized after many years that that was simply a way of saying there's somebody that has done the homework, is ready to play, and I had done my homework, hopefully. And it was a natural hookup. It was the way it was supposed to be between musicians who ostensibly think alike and have the same creative goals. 
that doesn't matter whether it was Billy Cobham or Vinnie Caliuta or Weckl or anyone. You sit down and start playing and instantly it's like, aha, okay. Let's start that again from letter B. And there is no issue at all. You know, I also want I wanted to ask you about Tony Williams, too. And your impressions and when you... I remember, I think you told me once the first time you played with Tony, but tell me again. I got a call from him. I was playing... Was I, playing with? I just stopped playing with Horace Silver, so this was... November or December of 1973. It's Tony Williams. Anthony Jackson, hi, I'm Tony Williams. And Tony was one of my heroes from the first time I'd heard the Columbia recordings with the Miles Davis Quintet. And then, particularly from the double album Emergency, Tony Williams' Lifetime, which came out in 1969. And it was a dream of mine to play with Tony Williams, and here he was, calling me for a gig. He didn't live far from me, a quarter of a mile. I went over to his house, and it was, you hate to speak ill of people who are no longer able to defend themselves and they're not here anymore. So I'll just confine my remarks to saying that at that time, Tony was going through a bit of an identity crisis and was drastically changing the direction of his music. Contrary to an extension of Lifetime, I think the greatest fusion group of all time, he'd gone to playing 60s rock and roll, 50s rock and roll. Um, I found out over many years it was a counter to certain other drummers who had come on the scene since Tony and were regarded as his main competitors. And he was trying to make a point by changing his repertoire. It wasn't a satisfactory relationship as far as the group was concerned. Uh, but there were moments. There were moments at rehearsal and in performance where the more traditional Tony Williams would come through. Either a solo, he never took a solo that was a true solo. There was always something behind him. We'd be playing a riff or a vamp. But there were a few times when, just as my early experiences with Buddy Rich, I had to stop, or almost stop playing. Because what he was doing was so far beyond anything that I'd ever heard up close. Unfortunately, there was some of that with Buddy Rich every night. It was seldom with Tony. He just didn't let go anymore. He completely altered the way he chose to express himself on the drums. But when he did get past whatever was bothering him that made him change, he was as he was reported to be when he was alive. He was one of the greatest people to ever look at a set of drums, unquestionably, up there with the immortals. If you put Buddy Rich at the very top of the list, really beyond the list, as I do. And then you, you have a handful of others, three or four. He's one of those. I wish it had been at a different time, but at least I did get to play with Tony Williams. Check, check. Um, I'm curious to know your approach to, like I, I sort of spoke to you about this before we started the tape, but your muting concept and how, for one thing, how you came up with, uh, I should call it the note value concept. I've noticed with you the difference between, one of the differences between you and other bass players I play with, you seem to be really in tune with the note value of the drums in terms of like altering your sustain or altering your, or, you know, or muting around, around whatever instrument on the drums is being played, kick, snare, cymbals, whatever. You seem to be really attuned to, to the specific lengths of each note. Is that something that just kind of came to you, or is that conscious, or is that something that you developed, or how did that work? Well, the main idea of a mute is from James Jameson, who often played with foam under the strings, 
which is the way fender bases still come from the factory and they come with a piece of foam rubber uh, underneath the bridge, that bridge cover that presses down. The purpose of that was to make the strings sound like an upright bass, which they never did. But it wound up being a very important part of the sound of certain bass players from the 60s, and Jamerson was one of them. And in attempting to copy that sound, I would stuff things under the strings. I didn't use a bridge cover. I always took it off and threw it away. So I had to put foam under the strings. I'd sometimes use a washcloth, foam rubber if I could find it, even um, toilet paper rolled up. But sometime in the late 70s, I started to use my palm because it allowed me to vary the amount of muting depending on whether the string was a high string or a low string, whether I was playing in a high position or a low position, whether I wanted a strong muting effect or a very mild, even subliminal muting effect. You couldn't use foam rubber because you couldn't change it quickly enough. So I began to use my palm and at first, for several years, I had trouble controlling my time. It just didn't seem to work well. I didn't use it that much. But then, around 1979 or so, I did an album for Shaka Khan, her second solo album called Naughty. Arif Mardin, the producer, let me redo all of my bass parts with a three-month delay while he recorded the vocals and did some preliminary mixing. Wow. I've never had that happen again. He said, okay, well, parts sound great to me, but if you want to redo them, go ahead. Hmm. We'll call you when we're ready to mix, and you can be the last one to overdub your parts. Wow. It wound up taking three months, and I remember as I made roughs and listened to them in my car, I began to notice for the first time that I was unconsciously doing some of the things you're talking about. Hmm. I wasn't aware of what I was doing, but I finally began to hear that I was really onto something with that muting concept in a lot of different ways. That was also when I first began to realize that I had a style. I never noticed it before. And I realized that it solved problems. I made the original track and wasn't happy, didn't know why, and I listened again and again hundreds of times, and I finally realized I'm going to try this, a new approach, which worked, and made me realize that's what a style is. You have a musical problem, fix it by yourself, using only your own wits. And that's when I took notice of the mute and began working on it. The time got better, and by the early 80s, it was becoming effective enough for me to start using it a lot. Mm. In 1997, I suffered a life-threatening illness, cerebral hemorrhage, which paralyzed the right side of my body for a while. The brain, if it lives, begins to recover at a fierce rate when it's assaulted like that. And within about three weeks, I was able to begin playing again, but I couldn't use my fingers, only my thumb. Gradually, the use of the other fingers came back. Pardon me. But at first, it was only the thumb. And without knowing it, having to depend on the thumb, that's when it really fell into place with the mute. Hmm. Uh, there was no other way for me to play but with the thumb. And the mute was right there. And so I began to really perfect the concept of the thumb and the palm mute and the flat pick and the palm mute first out of necessity and then out of choice and it works very well for me now that I've been using it for what over a quarter of a century yeah it's very it's seriously uh, I was just telling you this the other night I mean when sectionally coming out of something and when you when you lock into this especially on a lower note it's just it's one of those things that unfortunately people don't recognize unless you tell them. You'll find people, other leaders have told me, yeah, we had the bass player copy exactly what you did on the record. It doesn't sound right. So, he didn't copy it exactly. Oh, yes, he did. He copied every note. 
then I'd listen and I'd say, he's not copying the touch. He's not using the mute correctly. What are you talking about? I said, let me show you. And once I show people, then they're going, ah. <laughs> and then they hear it every time. But it's one of those things that makes music your own and nobody knows why. Yeah. And you often don't get credit for it. Well, it's amazing, you know, on this side of it, is from the drummer standpoint, when you when you play, when I play with you and, and like if I can play a, a straight up and down groove, two and four, you know, no, no nothing in the kick besides one and three. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like having a syncopated, or a, not syncopated, a melodic kick drum. The attack is like another kick drum, but it's the pitch. Drummers and recognize that. It's very... That's also... Makes it so easy. For me, that's a mark of a fine drummer, a drummer that hears that and will comment on it. So there you have it. Um, a very well-read, articulate guy, obviously. Um, and if anyone listening to this has actually played with him, you know the depth of where he's coming from and how it's, it's literally like playing with a sequencer. Um, he just has a, an amazing touch and attack and intent in what he does um, everything is so forthright and confident it's it's really amazing to play with him and I learn so much every time I do and I've been really fortunate to play with him in a number of situations and see him operate in a lot of styles and in the studio and live and just check out a lot of stuff that he's done so I'm really grateful for that